Hi everyone, welcome to the SEDU conference on the third day of the SEDU conference on strengthening evidence used during the pandemic and beyond. Um, I'm Eduardo Masset and I will chair this uh, session on innovations in machine learning and big data. I'm the deputy director of CEDL, which is the Center of Excellence in Development, Impact and Learning. CEDL is a cons consortium of several organizations, including the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the CAMBER Collaboration, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation and UCL, and it's coordinated through um, the London International Development Center, and it is managed by Oxford Policy uh, Management. Now, CEDL is a project funded by UK Aid, uh, from the British people. Uh, when we established uh, CEDU about four, year ago, four years ago, we commissioned um, a number of inception papers to set the strategy of the organization. And uh, none of the papers really mentioned uh, machine learning methods or data science. Um, or maybe some papers did, but very marginal way. However, when we started um, asking for submissions of research proposals from, from teams, many, or many researchers um, chose to use machine learning methods in the impact evaluations or uh, evidence synthesis analysis and uh, doing so as one of the key innovations and the novelty of their approach to evaluation. And, and so uh, the, the, the machine learning method became um, a sort of cross-cutting theme for, for CEDL to develop, and which is kind of a reflection of what happening, is happening in the field, not something that we set out uh, in the strategy. Now, the question still remains uh, for us, and to what extent uh, machine learning can make a meaningful contribution to uh, evaluation methods. And um, we will discuss this today with our speakers. Uh, we'll discuss this with Gassan Baliki, who's program director at the International Security and Development Center and research associate at uh, IGZ in Berlin. Alessandro Garbero, who's senior econometrician and lead regional economist at IFAD in Rome. James Thomas, who's professor of social research and policy and one of the directors of the epicenter at UCL in London. Carla Diaz Otas, who is professor of biostatistics at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Paul Jasper, who is data innovation lead in the data analytics portfolio at Oxford Policy Management in Oxford. And uh, so we're going to start with three presentations and of 10 minutes each, please. And uh, we will take a few questions after uh, the presentations, if there are any questions from the audience. Then we will have a panel discussions and uh, finally we'll take more questions uh, from the audience. Now I have to uh, warn the audience that uh, the chat function is disabled. So you can please type, ask your questions by typing in the Q&A box. And uh, in the Q&A box, you will also be able to see other people's questions and you can vote them up in such a way that you help me, you can help me to make a selection of the questions that are mo most interesting. The event is being recorded and uh, the recordings will be available on YouTube. So you can watch it again if you, if you wish after uh, we finish. And the speakers, buyers are available on the conference website and uh, on the SEDI website, you will also find some of the research papers that are being presented today. Remember that at the end of the webinar, there will be a link uh, that will appear on your screen and that will take you to a feedback survey. So please help us to spend a couple of minutes in commenting on the uh, quality of the um, session so that it can, we can improve our delivery. And um, please do discuss the conference on Twitter uh, using the hashtag SEDIL22. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Alessandra for the presentation. Alessandra, you've been leading a number of uh, projects 
uh, at IFAD um, that being used in machine learning or data science methods. And uh, would you like us, would you like to tell us something about it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm pleased to be here and um, basically presenting some of the, a use case that was done as part of the Athena project. The Athena is called Leveraging Artificial Intelligence and Big Data, was an innovation challenge project funded by, by IFAD to explore machine learning and the potential machine learning and innovation for the fund. So I'm going to present uh, about um, basically this topic, which is precision targeting. So optimal policy learning for data-driven project design. So what is precision targeting? So the idea behind uh, precision targeting is just to use machine learning methods or algorithms, algorithms more broadly to select the right beneficiaries for a treatment or a policy or select the right treatment for a beneficiary. Okay, this is not new because, of course, this is um, uh, personalized treatment rules have been used in precision medicine and marketing. For instance, uh, Wang et al. with um, learn, I mean, they just test individual, individualized treatment rules for insulin therapies to treat type 2 diabetes. The other application is precision agriculture, where mm, the paper actually discussed the potential for pre precision agriculture to increase food security by timing decisions based on more precise data. And also, like uh, machine learning, it also offered um, a new avenue for targeting, right? Because, for instance, uh, Gene et al. train neural nets to predict local economic outcomes for satellite data in five African countries. Similarly, Blumenstock et al. Et al use cell phone data to measure wealth and basically improve poverty targeting. Um, also machine learning and this idea of precision targeting is also useful to improve accuracy of targeting, right? So, um, and in this case, the paper by McBride and Nichols has shown how to use machine learning to validate and improve proxy mean targeting for USA project. In this application, we talk about policy learning. So policy learning here um, is basically a process by which actual or potential policies are compared and evaluated to extract evidence and make decisions for future projects. So here, the role of machine learning is mostly optimization. So what we're doing in essence is, is just um, constraining welfare maximization, meaning that if we want to achieve a welfare impact, we need to basically um, we need to basically have some targeting rules and we want to maximize they impact subject to our budget constraints because at the end of the day, policy makers, policy makers face a decision problem. So actually optimal policy learning solves this decision problem by choosing the targeting rule uh, that maximizes the policy impact and minimizes what it's called in the jargon, the policy regret, which is nothing that the difference between the maximum welfare that could, buy achieve, could be achieved by a program and what is actually realized on the ground. So basically we answer the question, what selection rules brings the people most in need and likely to benefit into the program? And so basically OPL, in short, searches for the rule that gives the highest impact. Of course, what are the data requirements for this? It's sound impact evaluation with robust counterfactuals based on either experiments or observational data. Okay, so why policy learning at IFAD and um, can we do it realistically? Of course, IFAD uh, conducts impact evaluation on 15% of the portfolio with counterfactual. So when we have a new project, ideally we would like to, to maximize this information. And of course we don't evaluate everything. So we're already confronted with a challenge. However, uh, policy learning allow us to link what happened with an exposed evaluation with what to do in the future. And um, we found that impact evaluation are generic, generally underutilized for project design planning. So OPL allow us to link evaluation results to policy planning and design through prediction of impact maximizing selection rules. Okay, so in a nutshell, what, what can we do with OPL? So basically we can select this benefit maximizing policy given project constraints. We know the policy makers are subject to budget constraints. The context is challenging. challenging. Um, and we can select the beneficiaries most suited and more li most likely to benefit from the project. So in the end, what we are um, offering policymakers, it's a menu of selection rules based on different criteria. In, an, in a nutshell, we just optimize these selection rules to maximize the impact. Okay, but what does it mean really in practice for the practitioner? What do I need to implement OPL? 
Certainly, I need an impact assessment or an impact evaluation data sets with a well-defined control group. Of course, we need an econometric model because I need to estimate average treatment effects and also conditional average treatment effects. I need a set of targeting variables, and then I need to think which outcome I want to maximize, meaning it could be welfare, income, and well-being proxies. So what are the outputs? The outputs is clearly a menu of selection rules quantifying the impact gain for each rule. And this is really powerful because basically um, we get three general parameters. The first is the number of people that we want to treat, we will be treating, the share population treated, the threshold for each variable, and impact gained over random assignment because we always compare our impact towards random assignment. Okay, but let me give you an example, practical example with a project in Tajikistan. Um, this is a real project, development project, and we did an impact evaluation, an ex post impact evaluation in 2018 to measure the impact of this um, livestock project. Basically, the project wanted to improve pasture management to combat low livestock productivity. So basically, uh, we apply OPL um, to learn basically these community targeting rules to maximize the impact on economic mobility, which is proxied by total income. Okay, so here we do some, we, sh we show some already some results here. We want to see the share of beneficiaries with positive effects based on a normal estimator. So this project was already successful because we benef benefited largely the beneficiaries. These are percentage of households obtaining a positive effect across a number of indicators in the economic mobility domain, we call it a DFAT. And we found already the beneficiaries really benefited um, actually 90% on, on total Gross income, gross income, which is a percentage of households obtaining a positive effect. So, well, all the indicators well above 50%. Okay, but let's play now with the uh, with optimal policy learning, right? We want to play with two targeting variables at community level, which is pasture size, because it's a community, which is of course because it's a livestock project, and the share of households with improved roof in the village, which is a proxy for wealth in the village. So varying the size of the pasture in the, in the community and the share of households, we want to determine what could be our um, optimal uh, welfare impact. So we already know that the, the project impact was about $340 um, per annum in total gross income. From random assignment was 328 And actually, the, the optimal targeting results, but actually treating just 21% of the population and selecting on Optim optimal thresholds of community communal pasture size and the, we and the wealth indicator, we found that actually income is, is increased to 20%. So actually we, we go for 340 to 419. And these are some graphs that show pretty much what we are trying to do. So the impact, the potential impact ranges from 18% to 28%. And here we see the combination of the variables, right? The targeting variables by varying their levels. So this is pasture size, and this is, of course, the share of households with improved roofs in the village. We see that pasture, pasture size is really a good targeting variable because basically it's, um, if we are in a green area, a larger impact. But actually, if we, if, if we decide to target better off, let's say, communities, actually, we end up decreasing the impact. Of course, as I mentioned before, the other variable is the percent, percentage of beneficiaries treated. Of course, if we treat 5% our best welfare gains are really high. And of course, the, the, the policymaker, of course, needs to treat a sufficient number of beneficiaries. So these are trade-offs that need, need to be borne in mind. That's why this is what I call a menu of potential selection rules, because basically, mathematically, we can easily select the welfare maximizing rule. However, we, there are constraints that the policymakers or IFA needs to consider, right? Which is we want to be pro poor, target um, poor communities, being inclusive, target as many people as possible. That's why uh, the potential of this method is really to confront the poli policymaker with a menu to guide decision making. But let me show you the results. What is that? What does this menu looks like? So, for instance, in this example. Um, for instance, we want to give another 6 million financing in Tajikistan. So we apply OPL to guide the targeting, right? What, what, what targeting threshold could we use in a new project? So we know that the new project will, will have um, 
291,000 around beneficiaries and the cost of beneficiaries is $54, so it's low. So this is the menu and these are the results from the application of OPL. The policy, these are again the parameters that are obtained, right? The share of uh, treated, the, the community pasture size and the share, share of, um, of households with improved roof. So if a policymaker um, decides to treat 20% with this threshold, of course, we, we gain a very high optimal welfare. The cost is low, but still we're not very inclusive. So of course, as if I'm being a policymaker myself, I say, okay, this is not ideal. So let me go to other, to other basically selection rules. I can decide to treat more people here 40% and basically achieve already a, a decent, still a high level of welfare. But of course, if I want to treat nearly everyone, which is 87%, I basically select everybody the welfare is still acceptable, but the cost is really high. So these are the trade-offs that of course need to be borne in mind. And uh, that's why I'm moving to the conclusions that basically with this uh, method is really powerful, but of course uh, um, hinges on a sort of dialogue between the evaluator and the policymaker, because of course the evaluator will give a menu and the policymaker will choose. So um, I think the procedure is really powerful that guiding policymakers to improve their exact design of policies, meaning learning from experience. However, there are limitations and the, the limitations basically are the data, the, the availability of the data. At the end of the day, we still need high quality impact evaluations or outcome surveys with counterfactuals. And again, the other recommendation is that we need to combine algorithmic knowledge with implementers expertise. Over and thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Very interesting. Um, I was not aware that uh, IFAD or anyone for that matter was using these kind of methods for project targeting. So it's very interesting to hear. Um, I would like now to ask uh, Gassan to present about um, a study in this case funded by SEDO, which is using machine learning methods to understand the impact of intervention, humanitarian uh, intervention in, in Syria, I believe. Thank you. Let me share my screen again, sorry for that. Can you see my screen? Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eduardo. And um, uh, today I would like, uh, as Eduardo mentioned, talk about a project uh, which is funded by CIDL and uh, uh, the UK aid as, as part of the, of the, of the larger uh, grant proposals. And here we, we actually want to see how we can use machine learning to estimate heterogeneous impacts. And the focus I want to bring into this presentation is mainly about humanitarian settings and conflict affected settings, yeah, because we believe that in such settings, and, and as my colleague earlier mentioned, that uh, it's important, machine learning in itself is, is not a panacea, yeah, so it requires an important design behind it in order to be able to, to do these estimates properly, right? But we know in humanitarian settings that we face lots of issues. One, we cannot randomize assistance, for example always given that there's always emergencies developing so targeting what has what has a baseline might change over time yeah which also have implications on attrition samples uh, small sample size or low power of, the, of our impact evaluations and of course it remains costly one cannot pilot and ethically also it has high risks and yeah, difficulty independent fishing participants for example yeah so given that this whole background of kind of the challenges in order to implement kind of more rigorous impact evaluations in such settings. I believe that machine learning can offer some breakthroughs uh, in, in this regard, yeah, which can help one optimize program targeting, which has been mentioned, uh, who to reach, yeah, who we can reach better. Uh, also, but more importantly, we can understand better impact heterogeneity, right? like who, who benefits from these programs, yeah, which might also be feedback into the program targeting itself and into future programs. But as well as, as I think there's also another angle of that, that we can also from machine learning and big data combined, we can learn about external validity. Yeah? So how, if we have some lessons learned from certain settings, how we can transfer them to, into other settings. Yeah? So I think these kind of breakthroughs will 
taking place today. I will focus mainly on the impact heterogeneity as part of our studies, but I think it has been mentioned that uh, before that program targeting is a key element as well. Yeah. So here we, we evaluate in, in uh, a program, agricultural program in Syria, which was implemented by the FAO. And as you see, it's quite large, complex program. Yeah. So they, it includes many different intervention arms. Uh, from vegetable production to water resource manager, uh, etc. And it has been implemented across a broad uh, uh, geographic uh, space in Syria, so around nine governments in Syria. It's a very ambitious program implemented by the FAO, and it mainly targeted youth and female headed households. And simply the whole intervention is want to understand does the program improve food security? Yeah? So, in principle, that can be done. In a, in a, in a way, so uh, or the, uh, or the other, like and any type of uh, impact evaluation where we have uh, where we can compare uh, control and treatment gr groups and see afterwards at end line if this has an impact or not. Yeah, this is generally not something new. But what I want to bring out here is that context matters, right? So uh, given that this in in Syria that we they have been witnessing lots of episodes of drought, yeah, uh, the, the conflict, political violence, it's also. Uh, 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 varying across in terms of intensity and but across also spa like space in Syria and there's been current more depreciation in the, in the, in the currency yeah so the, in the essence the starting point where we we they started the implementation of the program and when we go and start evaluating the end line things have changed yeah and the question is how can we really bring these contexts into into play in part of our impact evaluation yeah and so more, more specifically we want to answer how do contextual factors moderate the treatment affects itself, and here on food security, for example. But also afterwards, we want to understand how the treatment effect varies across these contextual factors. So, and this is something that I think might be very important, especially that we understand, for example, in our case here, I will gonna give you an example about the exposure of violence, yeah, which uh, come from ACLID, which is a big data, which we match with our survey data. And then we want to understand, uh, does political violence or exposure to political violence affect how program impacts work? So we do that in an impact evaluation design where we have a beneficiary and control group in a quasi-experimental approach where we collect baseline data, let the intervention take place, and go afterwards and then collect inline data. And the idea as a simple is like to really estimate the impact. And this has been done usually, and then we in essence using like one can look simple differences or difference in differences if you have a panel structure. But today I'm gonna, in order to bring this context more into, into play, I wanna uh, give uh, an introduction of a bit about machine learning approach, which is the, the honest causal forest. And in principle, what it does here is that we take the whole sample uh, from our study, both control and treatment, and then we let the program unsupervised kind of randomly select people, uh, obser observations from the sample. One, which is here in our case, the blue is used in order based on this whole set of covariates variables that we include, including political violence and any other factors that we think that might play a role into the impacts. Yeah? And then it kind of starts maximizing and optimizing yeah, the effect. And within each leaf, which is the yellow, we use this other set, which is kind of the training set to optimize the impact at these levels, at these leaves, at these leaves levels, right? And then we go ahead and repeat the same thing. We randomize again, we do it again, et cetera, et cetera. And then from all of those, we can kind of pull what we call the whole forest, right? So we're growing from small tree and each tree we grow and then we can grow the whole forest. And based on this approach, this new machine learning approach that's been developed by Wager and 18th in 2018, then we can calculate the conditional average treatment effects based on conditional, based on these covariates that have been maximized within each of those leaves, yeah? And here we just want to kind of show you a little bit of the of the results and compare it a little bit with the traditional uh, linear fixed effects, for example, estimates. Yeah, so we see here on the food consumption score, for example, that uh, using normal linear linear models, we see that they have an effect of eight on the food consumption score. So it has a positive impact on food security and estimated around eight score points for the for the treatment group, and even stays similar after we control, for example, for for individual and, and contextual factors using the normal, the traditional linear method. However, the honest, the, the honest causal forest estimate has a much smaller impact we find. Yeah? And this kind of underscores that as long as we start including more contextual factors, yeah, we find that the, the precision of the estimates do vary. And that's key. Yeah? And especially to understand how uh, 
if you want to bring these results into lessons learned and how can we future, we can better learn from these results into other settings to understand better the precision of these estimates, these kind of, uh, the machine learning might, might have, not have solutions in that regard. But also what I want to also highlight here that there has been lots of development, even as we speak today, that uh, there's new papers coming out with this method in itself. So everything's kind of new that we also, even if you had, don't have a perfect random sample yeah, that we have to work with, that even if we have imbalances because of due attrition. And this is why I think it's important for the humanitarian settings based on the challenges that I've described earlier, that we can also have like, for example, here's the average, the ATO, the average limit of the overlap, which takes the overlap of the, of the balanced sample between beneficiaries and control group and try to maximize uh, the, the effect there of the conditional average treatment effect. And then to the, my next question is to, what this additionally allows us to do is to see how the treatment effect varies across these contextual factors. And here I just want to show a simple example is that we divide the data between male and female headed households and we have classified different degrees of, of local violence. And then because of the machine learning maximizes at these very specific leaves, we'll be able to pull this information out, which if you want to use normal uh, uh, analysis, like linear analysis, that requires a huge sample sizes in order to do such subsampling. But given that this uh, uh, the random forest allows us to do that with much more precision. And, and here what we can see from the results is that we find that female-headed households who live in a moderate uh, uh, exposed to moderate type of uh, violence have benefited the most from the program, around eight percentage points. While we see that male households, for example, living in low violence haven't benefited from the program, which also kind of help uh, within uh, uh, policymakers and implementers, I mean specifically, to see how targeting works better, for example. And this is something that I think offers lots of, of new insights uh, in the field in the humanitarian settings. But let me zoom out as a conclusion, and I want to say, and I, as I said back in the introduction, that definitely machine learning itself is not a panacea. Yeah? So there's lots of elements, and I think that one has to bring into account in order to ensure that hum impact evaluation in humanitarian settings do work and do work best for the people in, who are being benefiting, but also for, for implementers and policymakers. And it's key to have an impact, a good develop impact evaluation design. Yeah? Uh, and important that to embed the study early on yeah? so uh, we can be able to follow and exploit as much potential of data that we can bring, both as, for example, administrative data that we can take, for example, as from, there's new papers looking, for example, UNSCR data, yeah? registration data, that they can use that for better targeting, and how to, to learn better. And this, I think, machine learning and new methods can be applied to, to have better preci precision on these impact evaluations. But eventually, the most important thing is to learn, to think about this evaluations as a process, the learning as a process, and the co-creation and building strong partnerships between research and practitioners and implementers. And I think that's, uh, that's kind of the key uh, um, element of, of, of success of such effective evaluations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gassan, and very interesting uh, presentation on how to use machine learning to identify different impacts for different groups of uh, people within uh, in a targeted intervention. Um, I will now um, invite uh, uh, James and um, who will present a, a work on related to the, um, the COVID, the response to the COVID pandemic, I believe. And so uh, James, over to you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, is my screen sharing okay? I think I can see a nod there. Great. Um, so I will move swiftly on. I'm going to talk about um, the process that we've gone through over the last couple of years, um, moving from a manual to an automated approach to evidence surveillance in COVID-19 um, and some of the lessons that we've learned from that. So I'm sure you've all seen these things, these maps of research evidence. Um, they can be very useful but they can also be very time consuming to produce and maintain. I can see also some of you on the participant list have been involved in maintaining the thing, so you know what I mean. Um, it takes a long time to set them up in the first place, searching lots of different databases, deduplicating them, looking through them manually one at a time to assess them for eligibility um, to, to the map. And then they actually then have to, have to be coded according to the whatever domains the map's using to describe the research. Um, and then if you wanted to keep the thing up to date, so you just have to keep repeating that process. Um, and we began one of those exercises back in February 
2020, I think it was, um, where we thought this this COVID-19 thing looked as though we should be keeping an eye on. And so we said, it's Department of Health, Social Care in the UK, should we? And they said, yes. Um, we had no idea exactly how much research was going to be involved in the map and how long it would be that we'd be maintaining it for. And so we found ourselves really out of necessity having to develop um, and evaluate and then implement various machine learning approaches just to keep on top of um, the vast amount of research that was coming out um, every, every day, every week. Um, and in doing that work, we've got quite an interesting story in terms of um, the development of these tools, but also maybe an insight into a sort of a glimpse of a future paradigm for evidence surveillance, which takes on some sort of different characteristics compared with those that we've seen in the past. So yeah, this case study, um, in terms of maintaining a living map, so a map which is updated in our case every week, and, and there are two important enablers to the automation here. One was increasing open bibliographic data, and the other was this availability and use of new automation technologies. So I'll talk about each of those. So we're all familiar, I'm sure, with finding research at the moment. If you want to find research comprehensively, you have to look in lots and lots of different places because it's just scattered all over the place. Lots of um, specific, often commercial databases. We are to take Boolean searches. We get the most relevant results into our local database. We do duplicate and we look through them manually, screen them for eligibility, and then we code them. A lot of work. So first of all, do we need to be looking at all these different databases? And there are some quite interesting developments now coming out um, on open bibliographic data. But there's obviously Open Alex, which is a relatively new one. There's Crossref, there's Dimensions, Google Scholar up to a point, though it's not very open. Microsoft Academic was, though it's now discontinued. But the point is really that bibliographic data are becoming commoditized in a way that you can get the same content from multiple sources. You don't necessarily just have to go to one place for for that particular record. There's obviously some places which are holding on very tightly to their bibliographic data and wanting to charge you to look at it. But on increasingly what we're seeing is that bibliographic data are out there and you can get the same content from lots and lots of different sources. So potentially what that means is that we've got this ability to get all the research reports from the world, every journal paper, for example, um, well, at least the bibliographic records to, to it, not necessarily all the full text. Um, and we can download the lot. So you know, it's quite possible to go and download everything in Open Alex, which is just about 208 million records, which is a lot of data. If you download that amount of data onto your desktop, you may well run out of disk space. So what the challenge then is, is well, okay, so we can get all of this research, but if we've got 208 million records, how do we find the records that actually are most important to us and relevant for our particular use case? So the second enabler is around machine learning technologies. So what we've built over the over the course of the pandemic, and you know, this has obviously been work which has been planned anyway, um, is this ability to have a continuous surveillance of the literature as it's published. So as new records arrive in these large open access data sets, so on the left here, the Open Alex data set, the new records come in and we have some machine learning. And the machine learning basically builds a model from all of the different reviews that we're using in the system to um, keep up to date. So we want to keep up to date literature on human behavior change, for example, inequalities, COVID-19 maps, three of those maps now being maintained in this way. So we've got models for each review and every single new paper as it comes in is scored against each of those review models. The, record, the papers that are sufficiently close to a given review um, in terms of the score are sort of automatically put into the review. And then we can also have more automation within each review to do more fine, fine grained judgments. So that's the sort of like the top level of what we found was the first enabler that enabled us to move from searching lots of databases to just saying, okay, so we can have an automated feed of one. What we needed was an ability to grab all of those data regularly and then to say which review they were relevant to. For example, that involves processing something around 800,000 records every week or two. So it's not a, you know, you, there's not a small amount of, of, of data. You do need to have some quite some tools which can cope with, with that kind of volume. 
The other thing which we found was very important was evaluation. Um, you know, the, this, this was working with a team of dedicated systematic reviewers, dedicated in many different ways, but certainly dedicated to making sure that what we were doing was high quality. And so we weren't going to roll out an automation tool um, without actually checking first that it was going to be meeting the standards that the, the, the users of the tool were looking for. So there are two main research questions, really, when you're thinking about um, you know, using a, a, a new search source. One is, is recall actually are the records that we're interested in present in that database and secondly even if they're present in that database can we actually find them a lot of the um studies that you see on this sort of thing look you know they, they do look ups on google scholar for example and say all of these records were in google scholar but what they're not looking at at the same time is actually can we find them efficiently so there's there's, there's both of those angles need to be looked at in order to sort of answer that question as to whether or not a new source is the one that we should be using. So we, we did it to begin with in one of the maps of research, which was updated weekly, and we had a very manual workflow, which was looking at the standard sources of Embase, PubMed, et cetera. We had a large team and it was undertaking a lot of work. So we collected data very carefully on the amount of time it was taking us manually to do things. And then we also then looked to check whether or not the records we were finding were present in what was Microsoft Academic then, which has now been taken over by OpenAlex, um, and also whether or not there were records in Microsoft Academic, OpenAlex, um, which weren't in our conventional searches. So we did this thing called, which we called the Octopus Study, which was an eight-arm cost-effectiveness study. And we collected data for four weeks back in 2020. And what we did was we compared the completely manual approach with changing the source up to this big um, open access data source, and then also using machine learning to um, identify the research. I'm not going to go through the study in lots of detail, but I'll give you the high level results. What we found was in terms of recall that the Mag Open Alex data set, as far as we can see, had just about everything that we were finding using the conventional sources. And rather to our alarm, we found that what we were doing and what we were doing as good systematic reviewers actually only had a recall of about 82% when compared with the Microsoft Academic Open Alex data set. So for a start, we found actually we, we needed to be looking elsewhere. Um, one of the key points here was there were lots more non-English language publications in the MAG stroke now open Alex data set. So that was a really important point for us to find out. We found, of course, that um, the new open access database would be more work because that contained more relevant studies. So we needed machine learning and machine learning made, made both workflows more efficient. But actually, we found in terms of the cost effectiveness analysis that our new workflow was better than the old one because um, the machine learning could make that process of finding, even though there were more records there, it actually still made it more efficient. So that was good and we, we rolled that out. But then um, that, that was an eligibility assessment that told us whether or not a particular study was relevant. What we then needed to do a much time is say, okay, so which category does something belong to? So the map contained these various categories here, you can see. Um, and now these are the current counts. You can see that some of these categories were into the tens of thousands of records, um, certainly into the thousands for all of them now. So that's an awful lot of training data, which has been manually put together. And anyone doing machine learning would say, yeah, great. We've got a large data set of, of, of high quality labeled data. So we then used um, a BERT model, which I won't go into details about what that technology is, um, but the aim of it were then was to put the records into the categories and you know in dialogue with the team they wanted at least 95 percent accuracy on this piece of work and so that was the threshold which was taken um, for deployment of, of this model so we've now ended up with a full workflow where we've got records coming in automatically there's one machine learning model which decides whether or not it's about COVID-19 or not it then goes through to the second model, which decides which category it belongs to. And then for all of these, where the machine cannot tell whether or not something is relevant or something belongs into a particular category, there's then still a manual assessment of that record. 
But what's really you know, important learning point from this is that we've now moved from a very completely manual workflow to a position actually now where most of the work is done through automated processes. So the learning points for us, increasingly open, complete, high value data, bibliographic data is out there now and we can use it and we can integrate it into workflows like this. What you do need is very high quantity and quality training data from the machine learning tools. Um, and a big enabler was we've got now got a, just a more mature um, environment now for developing machine learning. Critical was the availability of machine learning skills as I put close to the team. They were integrated within the team. And also this was then applied machine learning research, applied computer science, not necessarily leading to novel um, NLP um, papers at big computer science conferences, but this was very much tied to a specific workflow. Also helped obviously having the technology available to be integrated with the software that the team was using already. So there was no sort of learning curve from that point of view for the team. We found that evaluation was absolutely essential and dialogue with the team um, between computer science and the people actually using the, and using the products to identify what actually was acceptable so that the machine learning was tailored to the solutions that meet, met that constraint. So the conclusion is that in the right circumstances, we found that these technologies not can just contribute, but they can contribute significantly to maintaining an evidence surveillance on, on, the, on a particular evidence base. Um, and also the other enabler is that this open data, um, along with machining learning, might be a viable alternative to some of the conventional approaches which we've seen up till now, you know, the, the Boolean searches of multiple databases. So, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I think it's uh, fascinating to hear that uh, machines can help in conducting literature reviews and uh, or systematic reviews. Um, although they might not be able to write those reviews, they can certainly help to uh, the most, uh, the more tedious aspects of, of that type of work. Um, we let me see if we have. Uh, any uh, questions? I would like to remind uh, the audience that um, you can type your questions in the Q&A uh, box. We don't have many questions at the moment, so I would invite a, a panelist to ask questions to um, other members, and maybe I can start. I have a few questions about uh, the presentations. Maybe I should start with Alessandra. And um, Alessandra, you said that so I understand that the, the, the study was conducted ex post, and uh, so if I if I understand, and uh, so the the um, use the machine learning methods to predict what would be the you know the best allocation in 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 another context. So it, is that about scaling up the intervention in the same country, or you or you actually move into other contexts as well? Thanks so much, Eduardo. Yes, that's, that's an excellent question. Yes, it's to scale up the project in the same country. So doing a basically this is this project is, is called L LDPD. So for the phase two projects, right? So basically, uh, we are using very we were very lucky because we did an impact evaluation basically on this uh, on this project. And basically, for scaling up purposes, we did this extra analysis to see okay, but if we really wanted to maximize the impact, should we tailor? Should we sort of uh, modify the thresholds, the targeting rules, right? And of course, and, and we provided these uh, results to a country director that manages the portfolio. So effectively, we are informing the design of a, of a phase two project in the, in the same country with the same, with a similar intervention, of course, because it, of course it's, uh, it was pasture uh, rehabilitation, right? And pasture development and uh, boosting livestock productivity. So yes, over. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we do have a question for uh, James and uh, it's about, uh, uh, the question is, you know, those methods for uh, facilitate reviewing using machine learning methods. So are there, how long would it take to make those methods more available to, to the general audience to, to get out of universities and labs? <laughs> um, that's a, it's a good question. The some of the tools are, are deployed in in the Epi Reviewer system now, so you know people who are using that can use them. Um, certainly, that sort of that evidence surveillance pipeline um, will just learn 
the scope of any review and, and, and identify relevant new research as it comes out. The BERT models are a different matter because um, the technology there um, is both a little bit newer than some of the other tools that we're using, but also requires a lot more computational resource. Simply to build the models, you have to use um, these things, GPUs, which are the graphics bits of a computer usually, but you actually can use them for machine learning um, very well. So you, the, the more refined the model is, the more sort of processing power you need to build it and the more work you need to do in terms of um, you know, just 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 ta tailoring it to a specific use. So I'd say that some of the general stuff um, can be deployed very easily now and out of the lab. The other stuff still does need um, specialist input to get to get decent results out. And also, it's 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 not cheap if you're using GPU machines. Um, there's significant cost involved. You know, it, it probably cost us several thousand pounds just in terms of compute power. To, to, to develop that model. Oh, I can see another question here. How many iterations were required before the model was considered ready for implementation? Um, I have to cast my mind back here. It wasn't straightforward. I mean, that's, that's the nice thing about doing development work with the people working, um, using, using the outputs of it. So there was a lot of discussion going backwards and forwards about what the most, um, sensible way of implementing something like this might be, because you know obviously we wanted the map to continue to be high um, value um, and highly accurate, and so that meant that we continued with sort of some of the lower um, performing, if you like, workflows in parallel with the new workflows in order to make sure that we were happy with the new workflows before jumping over over to them. And so it wasn't simply a matter of sort of saying, okay, we've got this new technology now, we'll just jump and use it. We actually had to, each time we, we changed the process, we did some sort of parallel evaluation in order to check that we were happy with its performance before we jumped over to it. So it was less iteration round, but it was more that we did stuff in parallel and then moved when we were happy with what we saw. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from one of our panelists, Paul Tugasan. Uh, it's about the use of uh, causal forest and uh, that, um, so you mentioned in your slides that um, it allows to do subgroup analysis using smaller samples than traditional approaches. And uh, is that correctly understood? And what are the benefits of this? Thank you, uh, Paul and Roger, for the for the question. Uh, yes, it does in principle, right? So uh, uh, because this is kind of the, the the power of this approach that it's it breaks down the data into these small leaves where we know, for example, each like tree breakdown starts with saying female male, let's say, yeah, and then uh, this much income, this much income, whatever other covariates, and then we we maximize the average treatment effect within each leaf, right? So we actually know based on those different average treatment effects within the leaf, which kind of breakdown of these branches, so to speak. Yeah? So we can then bring this whole data together and classify them based on those uh, uh, you know, components, let's say. Yeah? So, but of course, how you can view the data, you cannot view it maybe in five, six angles yeah? might be, or six ways yeah? through. Yeah? It becomes much more challenging and difficult, but at least you can provide evidence saying that Look here, we know that this program worked for female-headed households, yeah, and we can be sh sure about that. So, uh, or this type of program worked for female-headed households. So that, let's go support, continue supporting with that or uh, with conflict, yeah. But of course, it doesn't. It provides kind of, uh, but eventually the interpretation of the evidence is qualitative, right? So this whole machine learning, you you have to come by yourself and say, oh, that makes sense. This average here makes sense, and then and then in itself it does not really optimize which where the intervention goes best based on all the covariates that's something that it doesn't do uh, as, as such yeah hope that answered the question yeah thank you gasan uh, we do have an interesting question from uh mike clark and also similar from um alessandro so i think yeah, james it's just for james and i think you can address at the same time so given the you know the huge amount of literature on COVID. 
uh, can you use machine learning methods to distinguish between high and low quality research so that you know people can focus on the highest quality research and it's how can machine learning methods do that if they can yeah no, it's, it's a it's a good question but it's not quantitative research um the good news is yes to a reasonable degree with this data set now we can identify types of study so you know we can separate randomized trials from case reports etc quite easily and that's that's one of the models that we're using so we we can we can do that um there are other models there's the robot reviewer tool which you probably everyone has probably heard of which i will have a um We'll do some risk of bias assessment on um, randomized trials, for example. Um, we don't um, implement that ourselves because you know that team's done it. Um, so you can identify study types relatively easily. The, the the one which I'd like to do a bit more work on are things like the diagnostic tests. There's loads and loads. There's probably thousands now of studies which are comparing different variations on these tests which we've all been using and the different ways in which they can be used and different thresholds etc and identifying actually the ones that are useful and you'd want to put into a review and the ones which are just these thousands of me too studies which don't really tell you anything new and you know they've only been tested on half a dozen people that's that's a little bit more tricky and that we can identify they're talking about um, evaluating tests what it's more difficult to do is actually whether or not they're, they're a study that you need to look at um, but that again it's you know with a lot of machine learning it's around the quantity and the quality of the training data as soon as you've got people that are sort of separated things into two classes for you then immediately you're able to start to look at building models and look at evaluating you know how good they are Thank you, James. I'm, I'm going to take a, a final questions to the presentations and then we'll move to um, give an opportunity to other panelists to, uh, to intervene. Um, there is a question from, for uh, Gassan. And uh, can you see any, any opportunity to use machine learning causal of forest on monitoring data to support adaptive learning in humanitarian settings before impacts are studied? Mm -hmm. So whether you can use these approaches in, in monitoring before the, there is an actual evaluation of the intervention? Very good question, Carl. Thank you very much for, for this question. I think this is something we ourselves are kind of thinking through, <laughs> uh, given that we, we work on that. And I think the idea is how we can, and this is goes to my part of my presentation, is how we can externally validate and how we can use machine learning to have external validity yeah? because we have lots of impact evaluations and in lots of settings in lots of countries about lots of different outcomes yeah so they exist in the literature and maybe that builds a little bit on what james has been saying but the question is how we can move into processing all this data through machine learning in order to to pull lessons but i think also causal forest in itself maybe it's not but machine learning is maybe there's other models which maybe helps us the question is maybe we think about ourselves that, that maybe has a potential to, to explore further is that we need good data. That's the first thing, right? But again, it's, it's such how we can maybe, if we know the context, if we know the weather, if we know the soil quality, if we know the, the, the general, and if we have all these covariates and the bigger the, the data, the more we can explore it. And then we can take the predictors from this training in the say in Syria and maybe use it in the same elements in Yemen, which maybe has much more similar Characteristics and the question is that how we can transfer this data to, to learn more external validity. I think there's a potential, yet how we can do that more proactively and that we can learn from it is still still to be to, to be discovered and to be researched. In my opinion. Thank you, Gassan. I would like now to uh, bring in a discussion other panelists, um, Carla. It, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine has been at the center of much research on. COVID uh, during the pandemic. And uh, in your view, what, what was the role played by machine learning methods and or, or data science in, in, in that research? Thanks, Eduardo. So yes, indeed, Leon, the London School of Hygiene was, was at the forefront of mo most of the mathematical modeling that was like cited in the news. Uh, I feel like maybe the machine learning and the big data science was a bit more like under the bonnet of, of the big um, sort of modeling, mathematical modeling, but there, there were two, well, one notable example was Open Safely, for example, which uh, early in the pandemic was one of the first um, bigger data sort of like resources. So I, I don't know if the, um, 
the audience is aware of this, but, but basically in the UK, many GP practices sort of like make their patients' records available for research and, uh, and then Open Safely did some sort of um, um, specific way of analyzing this data that preserved the data security of, of patient data. So instead of releasing this data for all the researchers to do the modeling there, what uh, researchers have to do is you have to code your, your question, you have to make lots of quality assurance and then submit your code to the Open Safety Consortium. They will do all the testing and once it, it passes all the tests on simulated data, they would themselves apply it to, um, to, to real patient data and, and get an answer that would then be fed back to the original researchers, right? So, so it's some sort of, um, it's not quite federated learning, but it was some, some sort of um, learning through simulated data first and then real data while preserving data security, right? And not leaking any information. So that was, that has been very influential. I believe some of those models have been used in um, prioritization of vaccination lists, sort of like maybe in December. So that was the open safely thing. And, and there is another part that um, we were using novel methods for um, monitoring of COVID using sewage data. And, and I think this links a little bit to what Gassan was talking about, because what, what has been done in this first stage is they use UK sewage data from, I think, around 50 sites around the UK. And, uh, and they were able to sort of predict the prevalence of COVID. And this was using just like supervised learning, for example, XGBoost. And, and what we want to do in the next stage is, can we use the UK data, which can be validated to a certain extent by the, uh, the extensive use of um, PCR testing and Pillar 2 testing in the community? Can we use this to validate these sewage monitoring predictions of COVID prevalence and potentially then transport these prediction models to situations in low and middle income countries where sewage monitoring can have more impact because of the lack of PCR testing. So this is, has not yet been completed. This is part of like a, a new study that is going to be done, I think, in collaboration with the Alan Turing Institute. And uh, but I think it has the promise to maybe take it away from high income settings to something a bit more useful in, in terms of development um, sort of studies. Right? Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Paul, uh, can you tell us something about uh, use of machine learning data or data science at uh, Oxford Policy Management in relation to either COVID or development projects? Yeah, thank you very much, Eduardo. So, um, yeah, I think in relation to COVID over the last two years, um, I, I would, I think I would like to just mention two examples that I think stand for sort of a broader, you know, trend or broader sort of benefits of using machine learning actually or machine learning methods in this context of COVID-19. So one of them is, and also, you know, in other projects or emergencies, in fact, uh, like the one that's emerging now in, in Ukraine and, and uh, yeah, Europe. Uh, one of the, one of these methods relates to uh, you know using remote sensing data and combining that with existing survey data to then produce sort of high resolution maps right geospatial maps of certain indicators that might be relevant for responding for a response to this emergency right so in COVID nineteen in particular. As an example, what we did in uh, Mozambique, we worked with the National Health Institute here with the Health Observatory. And what we did was to produce a map, a high resolution map of COVID-19 risk factors. So factors that we know from the literature were associated either with populations being particularly exposed or particularly at risk of falling ill from COVID-19. Uh, so we produced these high resolution maps by using you know, survey data that exists on these indicators. We put uh, these geospatial uh, uh, remote sensing data sets on top of that. We created a model, a machine learning model that can then predict these indicators for the areas where the survey data had not been collected. And so in that way, we had, we could produce a high resolution uh, map of Mozambique of where these populations were that were at particularly high risk of COVID-19 actually, either of exposure or, you know, falling sick. Um, so that's one, one example. And I think it's a nice example because it relates to many other contexts where data collection is complicated, right? So as I said, for emergencies or just sort of geographies or so where it's difficult, 
using these geospatial methods, you know, that combine survey data for the places where you have, where you can go with satellite imagery uh, and using the power of, you know, prediction of machine learning methods. That's actually something that's being used in many different contexts. And I think is being explored a lot. You know, there are of course pros and cons, but it's something that um, uh, many different, you know, uh, practitioners are trying to use as well, because it gives you an idea of where, where these indicators actually you know, or how these indicators are distributed in areas where you could not normally collect survey data. So that's one example. And then the other example, which is slightly different actually, but I think it's quite important, it relates a little bit to what James was mentioning before, which is, um, uh, you know, using natural language processing to uh, methods to analyze data that comes from social media. So for UNICEF um, uh, in the East and Central Asia, uh, region, actually, we implemented a real-time assessment of their COVID-19 response. And one of the things that they wanted us to do is to see, you know, look on social media and see what people were saying about UNICEF's COVID-19 response. And I mean, by now, there are many social media listening tools out there that can be deployed relatively easily, but you can also develop some sort of more advanced machine learning algorithms related to topic modeling and things like that in order to extract value out of this data for an agency like, for example, UNICEF to understand, okay, what are people talking about? Uh, what are what are the sentiments associated with the topics that appear, you know, and are we kind of as UNICEF present in the conversation? Are we targeting the right things? Are we, what are we doing? So that's, I think that's quite interesting, again, because it also relates to other contexts of emergencies where, let's say, there is a big conversation online, you can get access to social media data. G gaining insight on that, you know, is getting easier it's getting these methods also easier to deploy. And I think that is actually a big area of research as well, in particular in evaluations, how to get an insight out of that that actually helps you to improve the way that you're doing your programming. So those are just two examples, I think, where, you know, this, this these machine learning methods, you know, could help us to, to gain insights on, on implementing uh, or, you know, on, on how uh, projects were implemented in the past. Thank you, Paul. Very interesting. Um... Alessandra, I believe Ifad also has used uh, machine learning methods to address policy or intervention related to the pandemic. Could you tell, some, tell us something about that? Yes, so uh, as part always of, the, uh, of this Athena project, we basically um, try to correct for underreporting in the number of COVID-19 cases and deaths. So basically, because we had, uh, we wanted to channel extra funding to projects in specific uh, dire context, we wanted sort of to correct for an under-reporting, right? Because we know that in, in certain countries, maybe the data was not, uh, was not accurate enough. So basically we tried to build a model. This was just an example because there is a lot of literature on this. And uh, using basic alternative data sources like Google Trends on symptoms, but also Google mobility data, plus other structural factors, we try to correct for underreporting in the conventional data sets. And this is just to, to offer IFA the ranking <laughs> where to intervene in countries uh, that were suspect of underreporting. So then we, we use random forests uh, to, this, um, to this end, pretty much. Over. Thank you. We don't have questions in the chat box, so I will continue with some questions to uh, the panel. Um, now, there is an aspect of big data, the use of big data in machine learning, which is a bit counterintuitive. And, you know, the, the, the machine learning methods and big data, of course, they use big data, so large data sets. And uh, so that gives the impression that many of the statistical pro problems are solved, right? So you have large data sets, that means that, you know, you have your um, the sample size of a, a, a adequate size, and also it is representative of the population. But then for being so large, and in fact, it's being used for, for example, addressing heterogeneity and analyzing small groups and so forth. But then you hear that there are issues that in AI of uh, potential biases. So how, how come? So, so is there an issue? So what about biases 
in the use of machine learning um, uh, uh, data. So, and how they are coming about? Is there a risk of, of bias? Um, James, would you like to tell us something about sure. it? Yeah, I, th I think I've, 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 I'm sure the others will have plenty to say. I think that the first is that just because you're using machine learning, that doesn't give you a free pass over all of the things that you've learned about sampling um, in your degree those apply just as much just because you've got a very very big sample it can just be a very very big biased sample there's there's no reason that that should be, give you any more confidence i think in the area that i've been working at recently um it's quite interesting some of those um what are called language models um which are being developed um requiring a lot of gpu power um are, are basically trained on very very large amounts of text data and you get a huge amount of power from them um, and they do outperform some of the more sort of like the more traditional techniques that i've been using so we are using um, some of these new models but there is a real concern about the bias that you're building in potentially to the model because you're basically taking lots and lots of text which is out there online um, and I, I, yeah, other people have trained some of these models for us as well across across um, millions of, of documents and essentially then what you you have in your model are the bio, uh, societal biases as represented in the text and so you can see when you start to look at some of the relationships between the terms and the concepts in the models you can see that for example gender biases are very um obvious you know they're that, that's one of the most easy ones to spot and depending on how the how the how the model was trained there are lots of other biases there too so you know whilst there's a lot of benefit that you can gain from using them you know what's currently unexplored are the potential um ill effects of using something which is basically holding up a almost like a mirror onto society and saying okay so we, we're going to replicate you know current current thinking on everything good and bad and actually then that's what's then put into the models and potentially then the models are used for decision making which then enhance and and increase some of those biases which um have been seen you know which which were then put into the the statistical model Thanks, James. Um, so, as I understand, the sample can be very large and still be very biased. And uh, but Carla, maybe there is a way to address this under uh, any statistical machine learning methodology that I can address those biases. Yeah. So I, I, I guess maybe what we mean by biases is uh, perhaps, as James was saying, we, we're sort of like learning the the current state of of the world, right? And maybe that's not what we necessarily want, right? We, we were thinking of a, a causal question and what we're doing is a purely predictive associational model, right? And that's where the problem lies. So, so in medicine, um, perhaps we're a bit more skeptical about applying these answers as come because we're quite aware of confounding, right? So, so for example, this um, policy learning that, uh, that we were talking at the beginning with Alessandra, they're, they're not quite yet fully embraced because they, they have, been some bad examples where, for example, certain ethnicities have been not allowed to take like the most modern up-to-date treatment because according to the existing data, it looks like they don't benefit from it, right? But it was just because for societal reasons, they're, they're not considered to be, um, you know, um, I don't know, they're not considered to be able to take such treatments and therefore with the few people that do get them appear like they have less good outcomes, right? So, so I think what we need to be taking into consideration is the nature of the question. And if it is a causal question, then we should be taking counterfactual sort of thinking. And, and that does go a certain extent towards redressing these biases because it makes the researcher at least think, what are the possible confounders? And at least if they're measured out there, we can do something about it, right? With, uh, with sort of proper policy learning tools like Alessandra show um, and also this honest causal forest that Gassan was talking about could also be a, a good way of learning this uh, sort of treatment effect heterogeneity in a non-biased way, right? Despite the sample being, you know, representing sort of spurious associations, let's say. 
Thank you. Alessandra, you raised your hand, so you want to yes. comment on this. Thank you. Yes, maybe to, to add uh, on the debate that, uh, you know, um, you know, the OECD has released uh, guidelines for ethical AI. So the ethics of AI is, is now very debated, right? Because as James also correctly said, you end up perpetrating inequalities, right? If the data is not representative of the population that you want to study, you end up basically perpetrating bias. So I think the starting point is to um, acknowledge the bias, the presence of bias, and, and this is already a starting point. There are also principles for um, from the European Union on basically ethics guidelines. So basically, there's they're actually governance principles. There is also this, um, you know, these are the thoughts that think about trade-offs between um, the interpretability of these algorithms uh, versus the accuracy, right? Because some algorithms can be black boxes. So transparency enhancing the understanding of the performance of the algorithm. So this is so um, to keep in mind. Of course, um, for IFAD, the concern is uh, <clears throat> it's the fact that we work in data scarce environment, right? I'm now responsible for Near East North Africa division, the Middle East, and we know that the data um, is scarce and even impact evaluation data, right? And again, so we need to know the data generating process. And then also we need to, we need to rely on solid counterfactual, well identified. We know that ex post evaluations are very challenging vis-a-vis uh, -vis randomized controlled trials with experimental designs. Observational data have larger samples, maybe RCT are ab smaller samples, so there are trade offs. That's why you always need to do sensitivity analysis, I think, and analyze your data prior to do predictions based on it. I think. Over. James, would you like to add to what Alessandro was saying? Yeah, I, I, it just made me sort of realize that you know, one of the key points here. Is, is is that some of these tools, some of the machine learning technologies are inherently conservative in their perspective, in that they're telling you how things were or telling you how things potentially how things might be now. But what they're not telling you is how things might be if you want to change, you know, whatever situation it is. And so it's really interesting, I think, to, to sort of really sort of step back and think, okay, so actually, what am I gaining from the data that I'm sort of putting into this model here. How is it relevant to the you know, to the change which I'm wanting to see as a result of this implementing this intervention? And it might be, you know, because if what you've got is a data set which might be completely the same as you know, the data as the you know, the population that you're 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 wanting to predict to, it could be completely right in terms of that. But if that population and the data there are the result of um, structural inequalities which you're wanting to address, then you know that data set maybe isn't actually going to answer the what if question. I think Carla's point about thinking about the causality here and thinking about the cause and the effect and what that means in the model is really important because that lends you to sort of start to think and critique actually the fit of the data to the problem that you're addressing. Carla, I see you want to add to this, then we'll move to Yeah, just, just to, um, maybe, you know, I, I don't like thinking of the, the, the data having biases, right? Because the data is the data. And so the data could even be representative of, of society, like, for example, this, um, this uh, CPRD data, which is GP data in the, in the south of England, right? So, so that's representative of the south of England, is what the researcher wants to do with that data that potentially brings in the biases, right? So, um, so that's when I think counterfactual thinking and sort of causal thinking can help. But maybe as well to sort of like, sort of put a word in, in, in defense of pure machine learning prediction methods. So what I was talking about the sewage monitoring. So, so there we're not really trying to explain why there is COVID in where there is COVID, right? We just want to sort of like supplement maybe patchy testing in the community with predictions of prevalence potentially even picking up asymptomatic people, right? So not at the individual level, but at the community level. And there, I think maybe machine learning can stand more safe in, in its own feet because it's pure prediction and it's, we're not really going to overinterpret that it was because whatever, right? So there is no um, kind of fairness problem so much when you, you really just want a pure prediction problem like, like this uh, sewage COVID uh, prevalence is. So I think maybe, it's not the tool that has so much the problem, but how we use the tool. And, and there is a lot of careful thinking that should be had before we actually apply things. 
Thank you, Gassan and Paul. Um, in your work, your work is in vulnerable areas or vulnerable people, and uh, certainly with a lot of those structural inequalities that James was mentioning. So, do you ever come across issues of uh, bias in the use of machine learning methods in in in, in, in evaluating projects in those areas? Should I, should I go first, Paul? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, definitely. And I think exactly the, the, the idea of the absence of the data from these settings is kind of, yeah, or what kind of data is available, how we generate the data from these settings. And I think that's also type of that, uh, that, that drives this bias. And I think it, it takes me back to work I've done during my PhD time where we wanted to understand the conflict in Syria, like the, where is conflict taking place? And is there some conflict that we is overreported or underreported or not reported, and we understand, but but we only can learn this based on what available data was there. Yeah, it was the time the, the social media was, was was going up and they they posting videos of further conflicts taking place and, and and traditional media, but again, so we only have much to be able to uh, data to work with in order to make our predictors better. And for example, as as a as Alessandra said, like to fill in the gaps of the data where we think we we might not have it, right? And, uh, and I think that makes the, uh, help with the generation of, of more evidence data but but I think the bias is also uh, is, is, is going a little bit about big data and I think there's there was very interesting articles published in nature just not long time ago and it actually used phone metadata which is used by all other marketing companies to sell you stuff right but they tried to match this phone data which is huge for in Togo yeah and uh, uh, they sampled randomly uh, household they did the survey they estimated wealth and then they use machine learning to predict uh, the welfare based on just the metadata. Yeah? So we don't need big survey data as such. We don't need, we can use other existing big data that's available and it's been updated and existing, but we should be able to understand how we can draw the models to match the, the, the data that we can learn from versus the data that we can, or the training data and the, and the testing data, if you may. Yeah? So, uh, but, uh, but I think that there's potential and there's interest, but of course, definitely there's pitfall. One has to be careful. Without a good design, as I said, and without good um, test, what, what you want to test, the machine learning itself is not going to actually remedy all the, all the issue and biases that, uh, that might come from it. Over to Paul. Thank you. Paul? Thank you, uh, Gassan. Yeah, I mean, I think I think most of the, the relevant points were mentioned. I just want perhaps to add two quick thoughts about this. So one is um, um, the fact that that I mean, yes, these biases need to be taken into account. Of course, I mean, once you start to deal, for example, with mobile phone data, let's say in low and middle income countries, you know, you need to think about who has access to the state, like to these phones, who doesn't. If you want to map poverty using this data, I mean, then you run into the problem that the people that you actually want to identify as in like want to see where they are, they probably don't have access to these phones. So, you know, you won't be able to capture them with this data and things like that. I mean, that of course is very important and very relevant. And, you know, you need to think about that. But I would like to sort of add one additional thought here, which is obviously why this is so interesting, why we're dealing with these new data sets here, which is that suddenly actually they are, we, we are in a situation now where on the one hand, we have these bias, but we also have data now about places and populations and areas that we didn't before, right? So, and that of course is a huge, I mean, it's hugely interesting and it's a big benefit compared to, let's say a traditional data ecosystem that we used to have in low and middle income countries where you would have a national household survey every few years, uh, um, a census every 10 years, if you were lucky, sort of, you know, and so, you know, of course, that, you know, the, the pros and cons need to be weighed up quite, you know, carefully, of course, but I think there is very clearly there are opportunities here that need to be explored in order to understand, you know, uh, in order, you know, using these, these new data and combining them with machine learning methods that I think can be really helpful. And I think one thing that I would like to bring in here is um, one of the, that's the second point that I wanted to make is the fact that We've been talking a lot here about date, about impact evaluations, and and I think this is actually one additional really uh, interesting uh, place where a lot of I think rigorous and careful and good analysis can happen, which is where this purposefully collected data of impact evaluations that often is survey data actually and is collected in a way that you know uh, let's say in a, in an experiment even, you know, where the underlying uh, intervention is randomized, collected in a way that allows 
causal inference, combining that purposeful survey, like data that has purposefully been collected in a certain way, where you know how sampling happens, where you might even know your, you know, your lists uh, that you sampled from. I mean, you, you know, there's there's so much information about that. Combining that with new data sets, you know, big data sets, actually, I think can be very helpful because it can help you to learn a lot about what biases, what issues you do have with these other data sets, you know, that you might want to combine. So there's a lot of information, a lot of meta information about how data collection has happened in these impact evaluations, of course, also in, you know, national household surveys and things like that. But that can help you a lot, actually, to gain insights when you combine that with other data sets about these other data sets and about what sort of is going on there and what biases you might have and things like that. So I think that's a really interesting area of research, actually, and where many, uh, um, you know, institutions in low and middle income countries, I think, are, that are looking at that and are trying to see what can be done in this area, including, you know, the, the sort of national uh, statistics offices and such. Yeah, so just two little additions to this. Thank you. And uh, to conclude, I would like to invite some reflection on um, something that uh, Carla mentioned, that the difference between predict predicting and explaining. And I, I recently attended um, a, a talk um, that where the, the researchers were showing using machine learning methods to predict financial crisis. And the prediction was were pretty accurate, right? So, you know, trained the data on the past 100 years and was able to predict, she was able to predict um, financial crisis quite uh, accurately. And uh, so there was no explanation, right, for the, uh, the crisis. So normally in the past, people were trying to understand why the financial crisis happens and and, and therefore, and then predict it, right? But if, so, but the, the, the reason is the following. Now, if the reason why I want to explain the financial crisis is because I want to predict it, right? But if I can just predict it, I can just get away with, without explanation. Is, is that okay? What, what's your view on this? Um, I, th I think it depends what you want to do with it, you know, and just to, to, to say it again and again. So, so if, you, if you're hoping to intervene in the current state of affairs to prevent that thing, then you, you don't need just pure prediction and you need what we call counterfactual prediction, right? And so maybe you should build your models uh, as, as uh, James was saying, what if, so what if, you know, we, we stop quantitative easing? Oh uh, yeah, well, in that case, you know, there is a recession. Uh, what if, if we continue with quantitative easing? Oh, in that case, whatever, right? So, and then we take a decision, should we stop quantitative easing, right? But, um, but if it is just to sort of like um, patch up the, Kind of lack of data that we have. Uh, again, I think this this prevalence of COVID and sewage is, is a pretty good example, right? Because we just want to know what is the true prevalence, right? We we didn't really want to use that data to intervene, or at least not quite yet. Once it's validated, we may want to then think again: is, is does this goes further, right? And uh, and for example, James, I think he also just cares about you know sort of coalescing all this evidence, right? He's not necessarily wanting to do anything interventionally with it, but uh, I'll. I'll give the word to him. James, uh, I'll add to this. Yes, please. No, I think it's. I think it's really. It's a really good question. I think the 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 real key is if you don't actually have some understanding of the why. Um, you know, for the, the the COVID in the sewage, for example, if we if we just you know if, if we had that labeled as just one of the variables, you know, in, in our model, um, you know, what you what you could spot is oh, you know, there seems to be a sort of like a correlation here between I don't know um, admissions into hospitals and COVID in the sewage. So therefore, what we need to do is clean up our sewage, and that will sort out the hospital admissions. Uh, do you see what I mean? This is a slightly ridiculous example, but that's exactly what you know. If you actually don't know the, the what the what the causes are here, then you, that points to the wrong policy um, solution. That was a nice example, James. And anyone else want to add to this? Maybe I guess I can just add that for IFA, it's crucial to be able to intervene, right? So we need explanation. So actually the interpretability of the models, um, it's, it's crucial, right? Using lasso versus more, versus different black spot model, right? We want, to, we want to understand, we want to use things that can help us do some sort of feature selection, right? So we want to know how we can better 
how we can better tailor our programs to to suit our our needs. Like we want to maximize impact. Actually, we have commitments commitments to double the impact by 2030. So actually, we cannot. We need to know the factors. So explainability is important. Over. Paul or Gassan, you have a, would you like to have a final word on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, again, I think m most of the, the important things about causality and that, the, you know, the, the importance of thinking about this carefully have been said. I, I, I would just like to then, you know, add one thought perhaps on this, which is um, one, I think that what we haven't mentioned that much is because we, we're talking a lot about evaluation and about research. The, and I just wanted to raise the fact that, in fact, also one of the really big opportunities with machine learning is that it can help to improve um, service delivery, right? The implementation of programs, actually. And it's one area of the work in at least sort of in, you know, international development, in low and middle income countries is thinking about how you can really benefit from, let's say, improved image recognition. You know, um, I mean, there are, there, you know, how to... One of the examples that 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 I mentioned is that uh, there are some researchers working right now on an, on an algorithm where they try to, uh, um, uh, you know, where you can take pictures of uh, arms of of children, for example, in low and middle income country settings. They can and that can then allow you or could allow you to identify whether a child is malnourished or not. Yeah. So identifying child malnutrition is a very complicated process right now. Uh, properly, I mean, there's a faster way to do that with a sort of arm band, middle, upper arm circumference that you can measure to do this. There are ways of doing this quickly, but but you know this could obviously be one even an, an easier way to do this, right? If you take a picture and the app tells you, okay, this is a child that's at risk. You know, you should check that. For example, so machine learning algorithms that can help you to do image recognition like this much better can be really helpful uh, for improving service delivery. You know, to making things easier because in many places people have smartphones, of course, in their in their in their pockets now, and in particular. People perhaps who might be working for governments or you know institutions, uh, they might be able to use that. And so I just wanted to just raise this that this is an additional dimension here: how service delivery delivery can be improved by you know machine learning uh, approaches. It, it's a, perhaps a little bit less you know uh, a question there about whether it's about causality or not. It's really about how to you know make use of these methods to to improve the way that things are being implemented. And I think there is a lot of interesting you know experimentation that are happening in this area as well across many different sectors actually thank you gasan uh, yes definitely as uh, as a researcher myself not that I am, of course i'm always interested in causality learning and i think there's this definitely a potential to understand if yeah what works and how how but how it works but but in, in, in I think there's still much more potential of why you know and I think this is something that uh, in, in research kind of understanding more how we can dissect these whole mechanisms and how how we try different counterfactual different mechanisms that lead from one intervention to a certain outcome right and then and how we can maximize on those within things because it's still as a black box and most of the methods are still black boxes and i think there's definitely a potential to kind of move the the research i think in the future with more availability of data and more availability of papers uh, to kind of start uh, to be able to to break these things and, and understanding them better and i think there's a benefit still for 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 both research and, and practice and policy makers like so uh, Thank you, Gassan, and, and uh, let me thank uh, all the speakers for a very interesting uh, discussion that we had today, and thank for all uh, participants and those who attended uh, the, the, the event. And let me just remind you that uh, tomorrow there is another uh, session of the conference, and the topic will be uh, transferability, so not a very interesting uh, session happening tomorrow. There is a recording for this session, so in case people wanted to review or wanted to share uh, with others. And please, and uh, I will ask you to fill the evaluation form, so there would, there would be a link um, appearing on the screen uh, once you leave um, um, this workshop and uh, this this call, and and the link will take you to uh, the evaluation form where we can leave us some feedback about uh, um, the session. 
Okay, so thank you uh, everyone and um, have a good rest of the day.